the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding off-road side-by-sides. Featuring the value-minded new Ranger 800 midsize, Hunt Far More Trail. Polaris has the Ranger side-by-side -side you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Meet Nancy Asher, stable owner, visionary, agent of change. Learn more about her story at farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. An amendment to the Right to Farm Act, House Bill 1430, was basically substituted with another bill in the General Assembly earlier this week. Much of the language that protected small farmers was removed. Joel Salatin joins us on Ag Insights to share why he supports the bill in its original form. Then we'll find out how to add color to your garden during the winter months when we join Mark Viet in the garden. Plus, we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. Governor Bob McDonnell announced that sales of Virginia wine reached an all-time high in 2012, increasing by just over 1.6% from last year. Sales of Virginia wines have averaged just over 8% growth per year over the last three fiscal years. In addition, the Virginia Wine Marketing Office reports that winery sales outside of Virginia, domestic and international, increased by 39% in 2012. Governor McDonald said that growth is a testament to our grape growers and winemakers who are producing world-class wines. More sales provide more economic development and job creation opportunities, especially for the vineyards, wineries, and the many businesses supporting them. Well, the good news doesn't stop with Virginia wines. According to VDAC state veterinarian Dr. Richard Wilkes, Virginia horse owners have a new opportunity to travel with their horses throughout southeastern United States for six months using the new equine interstate event permit. Effective immediately, horse owners may elect to obtain the six-month passport in lieu of a certificate of veterinary inspection. That's only good for 30 days. Dr. Wilkes said horse owners have asked for this type of permit for some time, but VDAX had to ensure that they could provide the convenience of a six-month passport while continuing to protect Virginia's equine industry from disease. Horse owners may apply to obtain an equine interstate event permit from their accredited veterinarian. For more information about the Virginia equine passport application process, horse owners or veterinarians should contact VDAC's Office of Veterinary Services at 804-786-2483 or visit the website on your screen. Well, the winter months are a good time to do a little cleaning up around the farm, and you can make some money doing it. As Norm Hyde reports, many farmers are recycling old equipment and metal supplies. Recycling scrap metal is big business these days. Scrap steel is going for about $11 per 100 pounds. Scrap copper can sell for as much as $3.30 per pound. But recycling is also a way many farmers are doing their part to clean up their farms and the environment. Eugene Baer with Recycle Management in Page County says there are a lot of Shenandoah Valley farms with old equipment and building parts lying around. Many older farmers live through the Depression era and never threw anything away. You know, there's old equipment, there's, uh, you know, buildings that have fallen down either because of just the age or uh, because of a storm. Uh, most of these buildings have metal siding, metal roofs, and, you know, a lot of these things aren't steel, they're aluminum. Aluminum's a lot more valuable than steel. So, you know, there's substantial money that's just sitting in the way. That's definitely the case on this farm bought by Dennis Baker seven years ago. Baker has used recycle management in the past and likes the idea of cleaning up his property and making money at the same time. 
We just got so much metal laying around. It's been accumulated over years and years, and every day you find up something that's got to be thrown away. And, and right now, with the price of metal, it just pays to a little extra income from the farm. But the biggest advantage is just they bring the dumpster right to the farm, and when I get time, I load it. They come pick it up. If I need need, bring another one. But that's the biggest advantage. I don't have to take my time to halt somewhere. Farmers like Baker can earn as much as $1,000 for a full dumpster of scrap metal, even more for valuable metals. If you've got it out in your field, cattle can get fast in it. I mean, and, uh, well, snakes love them. And uh, so, you know, and, it, and it's just the weeds grow up around them. You either got to go take the weed here and cut the weeds. So sometimes you're losing a quarter acre of ground, you know, with a couple pieces of machinery sitting around. Besides, it looks bad. It's a win for our business, of course. It's a win for the environment. And it's also a win for our customers. If it's a farmer, he can put that money back into his operation. Recycle management also accepts batteries and junk cars. You can learn more about its agricultural recycling program at its website, recyclemanagementllc.net. And if you're not in the Shenandoah Valley, other recycling firms also accept scrap metal and vehicles from farm sites. In Page County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. Thank you, Norm. While recycling businesses are paying more for scrap, consumers are paying more attention to beef quality. Cindy Campbell reports. Don't sacrifice pounds for quality, I, I guess would be my, my biggest point. We, we've got a generation of people coming into this, into eating beef that they're eating burgers, they're eating a casual dining, and they're not experiencing that, that richness, that quality of a good steak. Jay Risky is on the front lines selling beef. The food service distributor knows if there was ever a time to focus on quality, it's now. One thing that our consumers are seeing is they, they just don't want meat on the plate. When, they, when they're paying extraordinary amounts of money for beef right now, they want an eating experience that they don't forget. It, we see that so many people, when they leave the restaurant, they forget about how much it costs. They just remember whether it was good or not. The most recent National Beef Quality Audit says that memory is most likely based on how the beef tastes. The other thing I think that's important for cattle producers to, to think about is that, you know, being able to meet eating satisfaction, which we don't really directly measure in this, in this, the National Beef Quality Audit, but we get the information back from the end users and they're concerned about, you know, eating satisfaction, especially uh, driven by flavor. Tenderness used to rule. But according to work at Colorado State, as tenderness improves, it's less of a factor. We have found in this that, that uh, flavor is a bigger driver than probably what we thought in the past. And I think if you look at the National Beef Tenderness Survey, which was released a couple years ago, and we see where the baseline tenderness looks so well, so good for the, for the U.S. beef population, somewhere in there, there has to be something else that then comes to play. And if it's going to be, you know, pretty tender, then what else are you going to do to drive satisfaction and flavor will probably play a big role. Cattlemen who want to gain on both goals should keep marbling in mind for all breeding and management decisions. I'm Cindy Campbell. Thank you, Cindy. House Bill 1430 is an amendment to the Right to Farm Act. Today, we'll present the supporting side of the bill when Joel Salatin joins us on Ag Insights. Joel Salatin is a well-respected author and lecturer on the topic of sustainable farming. His agriculture practices are environmentally responsible and ecologically beneficial. Today, Joel joins us to talk about House Bill 1430 and why he supported it in its original form. Joel, welcome to Virginia Farming. Thank you, Amy. It's great to be with you. Um, this topic has really been hot in the news this week, and earlier this week, this bill was put in front of the General Assembly in Virginia. Uh, you were there. Yes. Um, I guess for our, our viewers' sake, if you can kind of encapsulate what this original, the House Bill 1430 was right. written as an amendment to the Right to Farm Act. It sure was. The Right to Farm Act was put in decades ago, actually as nuisance suits uh, from newbies who moved into the country next to farms began complaining of odors and dust and um, obnoxious activities. And so it was put in as a right to farm, but the language was written as production. Uh, the right of a farmer to produce uh, shall not be infringed or, or whatever that language was. And, um, and, and since that time, that production 
language has kind of been parsed, if you will, down to where it's an extremely uh, narrow term and really does mean only production and not anything else, not the kind of things that you would see at Monticello or Williamsburg or any of those, you know, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker and the, the basket weaver and the loom and all that right. that, that used to be part of on-farm food and fiber, um, not only production, but processing as well. Correct. And, and so what's happened now is that um, with the with this segregated you know model um, we're seeing more and more local officials from from you know zoning to whatever uh, kind of what I'd call overstepping their authority and creating hardship for farmers for entrepreneurial farmers who want to um, have people at their farms, you know, want to incorporate right. the community into their farms. And I think it's important to say we're not talking about um, an amusement park type of a crowd. We're not You're, talking about Walmart in the country. Right, right. <laughs> These are, you know, small, and even the wineries, you know, when yes. they have weddings maybe a hundred people, but it's not that often. It's not like you're sending cars out in droves out to the countryside and, you know, creating all this kind of traffic where it's not supposed to be. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the origination of this bill. Um, sure. Scott Lingham Felter yes. from, is it? Fa Fauquier County. Fauquier County, okay, mm -hmm. well, he is the one who, who wrote the bill and it really was originated Mm -hmm. back with Martha Bonetta, yes. who is a small farmer in Paris, Virginia. Right. Um, Martha has been on our show, and mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it was really the fact of a, the zoning official there really overstepping their bounds, and this is a zoning official who is not even elected. Well, that's right, and, and what, what, uh, what happened there with Martha uh, is, is what many of us who have uh, a very integrated farm, a communally integrated farm um, uh, deal with all the time is uh, the, the inability to kind of feel safe, if you will, uh, to express our entrepreneurial wings. And um, so, yeah, you know, she had an on-farm store, a licensed on-farm store, like, like we do at Correct. our farm. Um, and and um, don't know still all the background, but for whatever reason, uh, she was fined five thousand dollars, I think, uh, for hosting a for for uh, allowing her farm to be used for a fee for a birthday party, and um, you know that that illustrates uh, you know we, we deal with it on our farm. Other people deal with it with their farms, where you literally live in fear um, sometimes of trying to do something a little bit unusual. The Right to Farm Act, in its historic form says it's fine to have a, a Tyson chicken house. We have that by right, you know, yes, you can have that. But, you know, to be able to carve one of your pieces of, of wood from a tree that grew on your farm into a children's toy and sell it at the farm, uh, that's over, you don't have a right to do that. You don't have a right to do that. You don't have a right to do that. Or to, to um, allow your farm to be used for $500 for a wedding or a birthday party or, or even for that matter to, um, you know, so you have a neighbor that has uh, a pumpkin patch and you combine his pumpkin with your children's toy that you carved and you offer both the pumpkin and the children's toy. Uh oh, you didn't grow that on your farm. You know, you can't sell that here. And so there's a tremendous amount of, of um, creativity and innovation right. that entrepreneurial farmers with, with marketing savvy uh, who actually like people and aren't, you know, hermit curmudgeons like so many farmers, uh, <laughs> th that actually realize that, that people on the farm makes good business sense for, for some, not for everybody, but for some. Sure. And so this bill um, tried to incorporate not only the right to, to, to parse the language in a production of a raw commodity, but also to be able to take that raw commodity and turn the egg into a quiche or turn the, the tree into a children's toy. Right. Or turn the, you know, turn these things into a more value-added product or an experience-oriented product. Correct. That was what we were, that's what the bill was trying to do. And I, I think it's important to note too that zoning ordinance all over the state are different from county to county. They, yeah, they are. Um, 
and this bill was not written with any intention to change county ordinances. No, it wasn't. Yeah. I, I believe mm -hmm. that um, the attorney said that the, the real reason for this, for this bill was to protect the farmers um, from the zoning officials, in, in no better words, playing God. Because they come in mm -hmm. and, and I believe like in Martha's case, it was by hearsay. Sure. And from, from my understanding, no one from the zoning committee or anyone else ever came out to investigate all this. Yeah. So by hearsay, she's being fined um, for several things and no one's ever investigated right. it. Well, what, what happens is, I can tell you as, you know, as a small farmer and a small businessman, I can tell you that, that when we get a letter from the county, it's kind of like getting the, the little notice that, to go to the principal's office, you know, when you're in grade school. and. Um, and the problem, and one of the one of the unique parts of this bill was that it created um, shared liability, if you will, shared responsibility. Uh, what happens is that you get some little, you know, um, overzealous zoning administrator. Well, even if they're wrong, what, even if they have uh, a friend who complains in about a neighbor. And so the zoning department, you know, goes after on based on hearsay, whatever. Um, the the poor landowner, even though maybe a, a court would throw out what the zoning administrator did, all the onus is on the landowner to to hire attorneys to right. to live under the onus of this fine and criminal activity and da da da. Out of their pocket. Out of their pocket. Out of their emotional. Uh, emotional, whatever. Well, you sure. know, and and so where the counties are are they have legalities behind them. They don't they don't have to worry the, about that. The, but the, the farmer the county, has to pay. The, yeah, the county can essentially harass anybody they want to, and they're not culpable. Uh, whereas the individual has to share the brunt or shoulder the brunt of the uh, the fight back, if you will. And um, there's no question as a result of the hearing um, that. The you know that language, which is which is everybody both sides admitted that's unusual to put that kind of shared burden mm -hmm. on on the to to create to make the bureaucrat as responsible for um, actions as the as the uh, private citizen. Um, that shared responsibility is absolutely unique and one of the things that clearly scared the legislators to death. Uh, because if there's one thing they like to do, it's circle the wagons around their bureaucracy and protect that bureaucracy. Right. So you think, what is the biggest thing that the the opponents of this bill? What what's the, what's their what is their biggest leg to stand on? Yeah. Well, their biggest leg is that they they, they feel like it um, it overrides local decisions, local governance, and you know. I kind of think that this, if you want to go to a broader discussion, I think this bill is kind of a, uh, almost could be seen as a bill of rights for, you know, for farmers who are trying to be entrepreneurs uh, that they simply won't be abused by, um, by, by local bureaucrats who operating on simply the basis of somebody's complaint, um, well, the easy thing is to say no. You know, right. It's hard to say. Right. It, it, uh, they tend to not say yes because um, you, you, somebody might slap your hand if you say yes. But if you say no, then you know you're on pretty safe Everything's ground. Everything's safe. Then, yeah, okay, safe ground. we're we are out of time, but I I wanted to uh, touch one more thing. Um, the bill this week was redesigned. It was kind of substituted with another bill that the general the ag committee wrote and changed some of the language in, and. As it stands right now, we're not sure if um, yes. uh, Scott Lingamfelter is going to let the bill ride as it is, it's or always, if they're going to pull it. Yeah. It's always a question: Do you let do you let something that really had some teeth and some strength in it uh, become gutted, or do you pull it and and come back another day? I mean, they they saw the crowd, right. and, and and the crowd got their attention, and so I I think that uh, that. We did make a good showing, and the question is, you know, uh, strategically, is it better to go with a poorly written thing or just pull and, and rewrite, come back another time, 
and uh, when, the, when the battle is pitched better in our favor maybe, and we'd be able to do something better. Okay. Well, Joel, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Um, I wanna let our viewers know that um, next week, Trey Davis from the Virginia Farm Bureau will be here with their side. Um, they opposed House Bill 1430, and we wanna hear from them and find out why and their reasonings, so we give everybody some equal time, but that'll be coming up next week. We'll be right back. Certain variety of trees can add a lot of color during these gray winter months. Let's join Mark Viette in the garden. Many of us think of brightening up our gardens in the spring or in the summer, but there are lots of other things that you can do to brighten up that garden in the fall and the winter. There's wonderful trees that you can plant, and over time these trees get prettier and prettier. Let me show you a couple of these varieties of trees that you can easily grow in your garden. Trees exhibit lots of different properties. Some of them have great foliage, some of them have wonderful looking bark, and then some also have this twisted or contorted look, and this is the Hankow willow. Now willow trees are really easy to grow, but you do need to remember with some of the willows, there are some branches that die back, and you might just have to cut them or pull them out of your tree. But this is a beautiful twisted tree that also has a great shape on the lower portion. One of the things you need to remember when you're planting trees for their beautiful exfoliating bark, as you see here with the Heritage River birch, is you need to be patient. You're not gonna get this effect right away. It may take you five years, it may even take you 10 years, but as you see here, it is well worth the wait to get this beautiful bark. In the dead of winter, you can see something of interest in your garden. For many of us, crepe myrtles are easy to grow. It is important, depending on where you live, that you make sure that you plant a hardy form of crepe myrtle that will survive cold winters. This is one of my favorite varieties, and this is called Natchez, and it has the beautiful, huge white flowers that are about that fat and about that long. But as you can see here, as the bark gets older, you get this beautiful exfoliating part that is deeper in color and uh, more cinnamon color, as you can tell. And there are other forms of crepe myrtle that even have pale gray bark. Real easy to grow plant for most of us. When you're looking for that nice, small tree, a tree that will not overpower your garden, but will give you a lot of beauty, you want to think about Stewardia. Not only does Stewardia have this beautiful silver and brown exfoliating bark, but it also has full color. When the whole tree turns this color, you can't miss it in the garden. Imagine this tree growing in your garden with these thorn-like appearances that you see here. This is known as the prickly ash. Remember, a lot of trees exhibit different traits and different qualities to the bark. There's even the cork bark tree that you can grow in the garden. And not only that, some of these trees have wonderful fall color, vibrant fall color, and they even have red berries. Some of the maples offer beautiful exfoliating bark like you see here. This is Acer grissium, commonly known as the paper bark maple. Certain times of the year, the bark is exfoliated, and so you see this new fresh bark, and then you see sort of this paper, lacy bark, which falls to the ground over the course of the season. And just imagine this with a backdrop of snow or a different colored backdrop, and you can see this beautiful exfoliating bark. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at our ag calendar, the Virginia No Tillage Alliance Winter Conferences are happening February 12th through the 15th. Farmers interested in getting into no-till crop production or expanding their knowledge of no-till will be interested in this year's lineup of speakers from all over the United States. For more information or to register, visit virginianotill.com. That does it for our show. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding, full-size workhorses, including the all-new 60-horse Power Ranger XP900, Hunt Farm or Trail. Polaris has the full-size Ranger you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family, Life, Auto, Business, Farm. Meet Steve Morse, fruit grower, distiller, entrepreneur. Learn more about his story at FarmFamilyPeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. 